manage the MI birds. Okay. And I manage the MI birds program. And that's an outreach and engagement program that's statewide um, in partnership with Audubon Great Lakes and Michigan DNR, which aims to increase all Michiganders' engagement in the understanding, care, and stewardship of public lands that are important for birds and local communities. And we do that a few different ways. You can follow us on social media. Um, we do a lot of outreach and education on social media, as well as a series of press releases and blog posts um, through DNR's email subscriptions, but also through Audubon's email subscriptions. Um, and then we also used to lead a series of in-person events, which have kind of been put on pause with COVID, but we're hoping to get those started again in the spring. And we have another series of webinars that we'll be launching next month. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for updates from MI Birds, um, and you can follow us again on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or visit our website at gl.audubon.org forward slash MI Birds. And I wanted to start off by giving a brief overview of Audubon's vision plan for restoring the Great Lakes for birds and people. This was launched earlier this spring. Um, it's the first time that we've had a vision plan for the Great Lakes region. So as a Michigander here running a statewide program for birds, I was so thrilled to see this come out. Um, and it's really acting as a blueprint for us for our on the ground work across the region, but here in Michigan as well, um, for on the ground conservation and restoration, as well as community engagement and community science. So the ultimate goal of this vision plan is to improve water quality and stabilize declining bird populations and doing so restoring nearly 300,000 acres of high priority wetlands, which is a huge task um, to take on over the next 10 years. And the main reason for this is because we are in the middle of what we are calling a bird emergency and birds are telling us that it's time to act. Um, so back at the end of 2019, science released the 3 billion birds gone report, which showed that we've lost nearly 3 billion birds since 1970. And unfortunately, this includes great losses across all bird guilds, including grassland birds, where we've lost over 720 million individuals. Migratory birds, our favorite warblers, orioles that winter in the neotropics, sometimes visiting Michigan for the summer or just as they move through to farther north breeding grounds. And aerial insectivores that live primarily on the wing and eat primarily insects uh, for their diet as well. Um, some of my favorites, barn swallows and tree swallows, have seen really great declines as well across North America. And shortly after the 3 billion birds gun report came out, Audubon Survival by Degrees report came out that showed that two thirds of North American bird species are on the brink of extinction due to climate change. The report looked at 604 species and 389 could lose many of the places uh, they need to live by 2080. Uh, the good news though, is that our science also shows that if we take action now and keep uh, global warming to just one and a half degrees Celsius, as opposed to a three degrees Celsius warming scenario, we can improve the chances for 76% of those species at risk. And two of my favorite Michigan species that are at high risk of uh, at least statewide extinction here in Michigan due to climate change are the bobolink and the common loon. And again, this is a map that's showing that three degree Celsius warming scenario. So that is the most extreme warming scenario. If we're able to maintain warming at one and a half degrees, we still maintain some of their range in Michigan. And this is a tool that you can explore as well on Audubon's website. You can enter your zip code or your county and see what birds are going to be impacted by climate change in your own backyard. Now, the threats facing these birds are those that also face us here in the Great Lakes. Um, water levels, as we've, as we've seen the last five years, have fluctuated drastically, um, and this accelerates the spread of invasive species, uh, flooding of coastal communities, including 
urban areas like Detroit um, and disturbing the natural ebb and flow of wetland water levels. We're also seeing habitat loss and degradation from urban and agricultural development. Um, invasive species also degrade habitat and those changing climates um, pose really great threats to our Great Lakes birds. Investing in our coastal watersheds now, especially wetlands, can create strongholds for these bird populations into the future. Um, but they can also help us mitigate our own water quality issues um, in both urban and rural areas and make the region more resilient to climate change on the whole. So I wanna introduce you to some of our focal marsh bird species. Um, these are species that have been monitored as part of the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program. Uh, since 1995, and they have been part of Audubon Great Lakes spatial prioritization analysis as well. So these are birds that we've gone out and searched for, um, not only at our restoration sites to kind of track and monitor their response to restoration, um, but also as part of this larger analysis and modeling uh, to try to gauge what areas in the Great Lakes are most important for marsh birds moving forward. And these are all species that have seen great population declines over the last 50 years. And this is a snapshot of the data just from 1995 to 2018. Um, so you can see all of these birds, the Sora, common gallinule, black tern, and pied-billed grebe um, are all seeing steep declines. I apologize, I'm realizing this has the alpha codes here instead of the full species name. So black tern, common moorhen, also known as common gallinule, sora, and pied-billed grebe. And our other focal species include the American bittern, which has started to see some increases in population over the last few years. Uh, Virginia rail, least bittern, which has also seen some increases in recent years. Uh, we think for least bitterns, this is somewhat tied to the deeper water levels that we've been experiencing. They prefer marshes with deeper water levels. And then swamp sparrows are somewhat holding steady. Oh, I didn't realize this was all animated. <laughs> so I wanted to introduce you to the cast of characters and some of their nicknames. Um, I apologize that the animations are a little off. There we go. Um, so the king or king rail, uh, the Virginia rail, which is also nicknamed the pig, uh, the common gallinule or the jock, the American coot, the popular one. <laughs> uh, the Sora is the loud mouth. Uh, the least bittern is the sneaky one in that vegetation. Uh, the American bittern is the noble one, and the pied-billed grebe is the comedian. And we're going to dive into how best to identify these species, uh, where to find them, and some of their behaviors. So the king rail, or the king, is our largest rail. Uh, it's 15 inches, and it is somewhat of a misnomer because technically the American coot weighs more, um, but this is the largest of our typical rails. And these guys are state endangered uh, here in Michigan, so they are very rare, uh, difficult to find, and would be normally breeding in the southern half of the Lower Peninsula. Um, they do like larger contiguous wetland areas, and they are, as far as other rails go, um, like our Virginia rail, much larger. Uh, they are about twice the size, body, body size, of a Virginia rail, and as far as defining features, um, compared to the Virginia rail, the king rail kind of lacks those defining features that you're looking for. So you're not seeing the gray cheek or gray facial disc. And the bill is a much, um, well, it's not as bright of a color. The Virginia rail bills are brighter orange. And then the calls and sounds that the king rail make all have this keck call in the beginning. So we're going to listen to the keck call and then some of the Keck Burr and Keck Hurrah calls for a little bit just to get you familiar with their, their sounds because all of these secretive marsh birds are more often heard than they're seen. So it's really important, um, probably more important to try to learn some of their calls and songs as opposed to uh, some of those identifying features by sight just because it's a lot easier to hear some of these birds than see them. 
Uh, with that said, for king rails, since they're so rare and state endangered, if you do think you've encountered one, you should do your best to confirm that uh, identification by sight if possible, um, or reach out to another birder in your community to confirm the sighting, uh, as well as the land manager, because we're, we're always excited to find more of these birds um, and informing the right folks about that. So here is the Keck call. Can you all hear that? And then the tech hurrah call. Let's see if I can stop this one. Usually I see a little pop up that shows me the recording bar, but it's not showing up right now. So we'll have to listen to the whole thing. They're all short clips though. Much more aggressive call. And then the Keck burr. That's a combination of the Keck burr and the Keck hurrah there at the end. So the Keck call is most common. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can't stop it. <laughs> it should end. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm going to just click through and then go back and I won't click any of the audio. Um, so that Keck call is what you would most likely encounter. Um, that first Keck call, but it's very similar to um, a northern cricket frog. So that's another call that you might need to listen to to hear the difference. Um, the cricket frog is more rapid and a, almost slightly higher pitched in, in my opinion, but um, they are difficult to tell apart, but it, the frequency at which that call is given also is faster with the frog and it kind of increases in frequency as the, the frog calls compared to the king rail, which is more, more consistent with a little more space in between each keck call. So where to find king rails? Um, they can be found in fresh and brackish marsh. So brackish water is slightly salty, um, but not full ocean water. Um, so along the coasts here, they'd be in some, some slightly brackish marshes along the coasts. And they typically like wetlands that have dense vegetation um, like this with a very dense cattail or bulrush and some open water. And this is partly why they're also very difficult to find because they're often in that dense vegetation. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's tough to, to find them when they're, they're there. They do, however, forage usually on the edge. So that's a good spot to look for them. Um, they will occasionally pop out of that vegetation while they're eating. Um, so the male during courtship um, will walk about flashing his white undertail and he'll give that keck call that we heard. Um, so again, during the summer months, that is probably the most likely call you will hear, uh, especially during May and into early June while they are courting. And then when they nest, they lay six to 15 eggs on a platform or cup of dead grass or sedges above the water. And after hatching, the young, as you can see in this photo, sorry, it's a little grainy, are, have these really thick black down feathers. Um, so really not what you would expect, um, but they stand out. That's, that's one thing about the young. Um, when they are in vegetation like this, they can really pop. Um, when they're more in open water, though, they can blend in really well with those darker colors. And again, for foraging, they will come out along the edge of the emergent vegetation, probing in mud and water for seeds, small fish, and mollusks. So these birds typically prefer shallower water wetlands um, to match that feeding behavior and foraging behavior. And then the Virginia rail, the pig. <laughs> Um, the reason that the Virginia rail is nicknamed the pig is because its species name here, the, I'm not sure about pronunciation, I did not take Latin, but Limicola um, means one that dwells in the mud. 
Um, and one of their calls also sounds a lot like a pig, in my opinion. So a dual, dual reason for the nickname here. Um, so the Virginia rail is about half the size of the King rail, and it has those defining features that the King rail just lacked. Um, this gray cheek, this gray face, and that bright orange bill are really key identifying features of this bird. And we'll just listen to uh, the one call since I can't stop the audio files. Um, but the grunt is the one that sounds most like a pig in my opinion. Um, but you can also hear all of these calls are available um, at the Audubon field guide, um, as well as all about birds um, species account for Virginia rail. Uh, so you can hear the difference between the ticket, the grunt, the squawk and the kicker calls. But here's the grunt. Very common to hear this one as well. <laughs> and as you can see, they do breed across the state um, in wetlands across the state. So this is one you could encounter at a wetland near you um, with a lot higher likelihood compared to the king rail. Um, so where to find Virginia rails? Uh, similar to the king rail, they really like freshwater or brackish marshes uh, with emergent vegetation like cattail and bulrush. They also prefer shallower water areas with those mud flats. Um, again, their name and, and the pig reference, they like to forage in muddy areas. Um, but they like uh, 40 to 70 percent interspersion of emergent vegetation with open water. So most of these marsh birds like what we call uh, hemi marsh. So that's 50% open water, 50% emergent vegetation, and having a different patchiness of each present. So for Virginia rail, they like 40 to 70% of each of those different things being present within the wetland that they're in. Um, so their behaviors for foraging, again, by probing, they're eating mostly insects. Um, but they can use their wings to propel themselves underwater so they can forage for, for other food deeper in the water. Um, but they still, again, are in shallower water, so they're not going to be diving as deeply as pied-billed grebes, for example. Um, their nests are placed in dry areas, usually, of the marsh or in a clump of vegetation above the water again, um, similar to the king rail. And then the male gives the ticket courtship call in the spring and then pairs duet with that grunt call. And the common gallinule is our jock. Um, this bird is shaped kind of like a football and has that facial shield, like it's wearing a helmet. Um, so we thought that that was a, a good, good nickname for the common gallinule. And these are some of my favorite birds to encounter. Lots of attitude. Um, again, typically come out uh, around the edges of some of emergent vegetation, but really like to be in open water as well, um, which you might not expect given their feet. They don't really have webbed feet, but they're actually good swimmers. Um, so these birds typically breed in the southern half of Michigan, um, but can be found elsewhere as well. And one of my favorite calls of theirs is the wipeout call. So it's like that safari song um, that starts with the wipeout. That's exactly what this sounds like. And you may hear this in a wetland near you. That wipeout call. Um, so their defining features um, are really that red facial shield uh, and that that body shape and size. Um, and their habitat preferences, uh, they do like that half emergent vegetation, half open water. And like I mentioned, they are often associated with that emergent vegetation with cattail. Um, but they are often seen in open water as depicted here, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, um, but they, they are a fun one to encounter in the field and their fledglings have a fun pattern on their face and are also um, 
primarily in black uh, fuzz with a little bit of that reddish um, color to their face where their facial shield will develop and some white stripes as well. So they can look quite different from the adults, um, but they're often seen together and then they molt out of that into grayer juvenile plumage. So their behaviors, again, with foraging, um, they mainly feed on grass and seeds. Uh, they also will get snails um, from the water surface and floating vegetation. And then their nests are on floating mats of dead vegetation, usually cattail, and several other marsh bird species make those floating nests on dead mats of uh, vegetation, uh, like the black tern and a few others that we'll chat about in a bit. Um, so those are pretty susceptible. It's a really unsteady environment to have your nest at. If a big storm comes in or a spring seiche where Great Lakes water levels are breathing, um, that could actually tip a nest and cause eggs to roll out of it. So um, if that occurs, these birds will re-nest. And parental aggression is common with these birds. So if you do get a little too close to a nest or some juveniles, they will let their presence be known. and the American coot, uh, our popular one. Um, so this bird is similar in size and shape uh, to the common gallinule, and it even has a facial shield, um, but the facial shield of the American coots is white in color. And this is their breeding range. Um, some of these birds can be seen in Southern Michigan, Southeast and Southwest, uh, year round through the winter. Uh, and their behavior, they mostly dabble um, on vegetation, but they'll also dive and dip their head underwater. Um, they nest also on a floating platform of dead cattail, similar to the common gallinule. And these birds form really large flocks during winter and migration. So if you are in Southwest, Southeast Michigan during winter, this is a species you could see in really great numbers and high density at wetlands. Um, and there's also extended splattering um, on water surface when they take off, as you can see in this photo. Um, so if you encounter a large group of birds, but you don't have binoculars or they're too far away and you're seeing a lot of this water coming off the surface, it's likely a group of coots. <laughs> Um, so coot facts, I love their feet. Their feet are so beautiful. Um, they have these lobed feet or lobed toes um, that can really help provide them balance when they're walking on mucky surfaces. And similar um, to the gallinules, these are birds that you might not think are great swimmers um, because of their body type, but they can swim fairly well as well in those deeper waters and these uh, lobed feet can help with that as well. Um, they do often steal food from other birds, so they, you might encounter them being chased off by other birds, and that is the reason why. Um, and during the breeding season, they prefer marsh with deeper waters um, and heavier stands of emergent vegetation. So different water levels than the king rail, but similar uh, density of vegetation. And so these two can be confused uh, for one another because of their size and shape and their, their overall body type. Um, but it's just important to remember that the common gallinules have those red facial shields, whereas the American coots have those white facial shields. And that takes us to the Sora or the laughed mouth. <laughs> um, this is one of our, our smaller rails here in Michigan. A much smaller bird compared to uh, the last four we've mentioned. And one thing I love about the Sora um, as far, far as identifying features is not just the fact that they have this kind of dark mask uh, along the front of the face, but they also have this really bright yellow uh, bill. And the shape of the bill makes me think of candy corn. Um, it's a, it's a bright colored, brightly colored like candy corn. Um, and their songs and sounds uh, of their calls are so sweet as well as far as the pitch. Um, so I think of them overall as a very sweet bird and it, it really helped me um, remember how to identify them early on when I was first learning my marsh birds. 
Um, so they have a few different calls that are pretty common, but we will listen to the one that sounds similar to their name, their per weep call, uh, which also sounds like they're saying Sora. Um, so we'll take a listen to that one. I think it might go again. So one of the reasons the Sora is called the, the loud mouth um, is because they are very vocal. Um, they will call in response to just loud noises sometimes, uh, and they're also highly vocal during migration when not that many other marsh birds are. Um, so this is one that even though we've now entered fall migration, you might still encounter in a wetland and hear them making that call. Um, as far as foraging goes, this is another uh, marsh bird that likes to probe in muddy wetland edges. And they primarily eat insects and seeds, um, but they can swim and dive. Again, not what you would expect given their longer legs and long narrow toes, um, but they can swim and dive for food as well uh, while they're foraging. And then they nest, um, they create a woven basket above the water. So similar to a red-winged blackbird uh, nest where they weave this, this little cup nest in the emergent vegetation above the water. And this is one of my coworkers, uh, Stephanie Bielke, who's based out of our Chicago office, who had the lovely opportunity to band and handle some soras this past year. Um, she, it was a really great project. Um, we don't know that much um, about Sora's movements, so that folks were putting nano tags on some soras out in Illinois. Um, they are the most abundant North American rail. And we do know a good amount of information about their populations because they are a hunted species in 31 states, um, including Michigan. And it's important to note that these are one of the species that could possibly breed in small wetlands um, that are smaller than 1.2 acres. And that has a lot of management implications. Uh, most of these other marsh birds really prefer larger contiguous wetlands. Um, and there have been some attempts here in Michigan, as well as in Indiana, to remove wetlands protections um, from these smaller wetland parcels or ephemeral wetlands, uh, which can be really valuable to wildlife, including some of these marsh bird species, um, but also species that rely on things like vernal pools that are also ephemeral and would kind of fall under that category as well. So Sora is one of those birds that that could survive in smaller wetlands and breed. Um, so if you have a smaller wetland too, that's not as large as say, you know, Grand Haven State Game Area nearby, um, the Sora is one that you could potentially find in a smaller wetland area. And then the least bittern, um, we're introducing the sneaky one here. I like to call the least bittern the sneaky one because they, like to be within the dense vegetation so much of the time. Um, these birds nest in freshwater and brackish marshes as well, and they rely on that tall vegetation because they are surprisingly found in deeper water areas, and they'll hunt um, from the dense vegetation. So like this bird um, here in the photograph, they'll grasp on to the cattail or bulrush and lean over the open water and then hunt um, from, from the emergent vegetation. It's pretty spectacular to see. Um, but because of that, they can also be really hard to find because they are constantly on the move, moving in and out in between all of the, the dense emergent vegetation within wetlands. So unless you're lucky enough to spot one as it's on the edge of a stand of emergent vegetation, um, sometimes they can just be those that you hear and, and don't see. Um, this photo is of a fledgling, so that's why it has all of that white fuzz all over its body. 
um, that will eventually wear off uh, the tips of those feathers and then it will look more like um, an adult female. Um, and as you can see too, as far as their diet, they have a very wide range of food that they eat. Um, they are really the generalist of the wetland. They'll forage on small fish, small snakes, small frogs, uh, tadpoles, as well as dragonflies and other insect larvae, uh, crawfish, shrews and mice, and more. The list went on. So um, they are incredible hunters and uh, very uh, lucky to be to be such generalists um, so they can find food that they need um, readily. So the least bittern is smaller than the American bittern um, quite significantly. And one other note, uh, they both have this streaking down the chest, um, but the least bittern, at least the males, uh, have this dark cloak as well on the head and down the back. On the females um, here, it, you can see that it is a little darker on the head and back, but it's more of a dark brown. The contrast isn't as, as high as it is on the males, um, but that's still another defining feature. And then additionally, their behavior. Uh, if they are on emergent vegetation like this, grasping onto it, it is likely you're seeing a least bittern. Um, you would not find an American bittern uh, climbing the vegetation like this or, or maneuvering within vegetation like this. Um, those birds, the American bitterns, would more likely be on the ground um, or in, in shallower, mucky waters of their marsh. So we'll listen to their coo call real quick. That one might be harder to hear. I remember this. This recording is a little more difficult. Kind of their ghostly call. <laughs> I think that's it for that one. And then we can listen to, oh, no, one more. Let's say we can listen to their cack hurt call as well. is more aggressive. And then by comparison, we have the American bittern, a much larger bird, again, more likely to be seen walking on land or on uh, dead vegetation um, on top of shallower water or in shallower water. Um, as you can see, they, they do still have that streaking down the breast. And this is a very typical stance that they might take, um, similar to the least bittern. If they hear a loud noise or uh, another disturbance in the area, or there might be a predator nearby, they will freeze um, and go into this position where their head is upright. So the streaks on their breast can align with the vegetation behind them and they blend in really well. And then as you can see, the eyes are oriented so they can see whatever might come at them. Um, so they are on alert and occasionally they will also sway slightly so to act like they are some of that emergent vegetation blowing in the wind. Um, these birds are heard more often than seen uh, for sure, especially because their call can be heard up to 1600 feet away. Um, I love their call. Uh, we'll play that on the next slide. Um, definitely one of my favorite sounds to hear in a marsh in the morning. Um, they also nest in freshwater marshes, again with that tall emergent vegetation, um, but they do prefer areas with less dense vegetation and again shallower waters um, compared to the least bittern. These birds also don't have quite the large repertoire in their diet. Uh, they forage on insects, crustaceans, amphibians, reptiles, and small mammals. It's still a lot. Um, they also are a great generalist and can find food um, at many different times of year to be with that variety of diet. Um, these birds also usually forage in dim light along wetland edges. So this is one that you're most likely to encounter very shortly after sunrise um, is when they are most active or, or uh, at dusk as well. 
So here's the American bittern, again, a much larger bird. Um, their legs and their feet are much uh, chunkier than the least bittern. And they have that breast streaking. Um, what you can see here on these individuals too, that might be a little hard to, to see um, in these photos are these black malar stripes or mustache stripes. Um, and that's typical on the males, and it's usually more visible when they have their necks ex extended. Um, but that's a, a feature that an American bittern would have that a least bittern would not have um, if you're only getting a front view. Um, that's one thing to look out for to differentiate them. And then also the behavior again, um, whether they're on the ground or in climbing the vegetation, um, and the size. And I know sometimes that can be difficult depending on where you are and how far away they are from you. Um, but these birds are, are significantly larger than those least bitterns. Um, and, and their range, you can see they breed across most of Michigan, um, less common in the lower peninsula than the upper peninsula. Um, but you can still see them at a lot of uh, important bird areas and Michigan wetland wonders. Um, so here's their punker lunk call. Now this is a very unique sound. They're actually gulping air when they're making that sound. And it's so loud. Again, it can be heard from up to 1600 feet away. It almost sounds like somebody's throwing some big rocks into some, some bodies of water, that big punk or lunk call. I'll have to visit some of the uh, wetland wonders closer to you all um, out in Ottawa, Kent, and Muskegon counties. Um, but here in Southeast Michigan, I know I've encountered these birds at Wigwam Bay State Wildlife Area, uh, Nyanquin Point, and at St. Clair Flats. And then the pied-billed grebe, our comedian. Um, so this bird is part submarine. Um, it, they're amazing. They can actually trap water in their feathers and have great control over their buoyancy. Um, but because of this, sometimes it can be difficult to identify them um, because it can make them look smaller or larger uh, at different times. Uh, these birds typically live on bodies of flat, sluggish, uh, fresh or brackish water, and they forage in that open water on small fish, crustaceans, and aquatic insects. Uh, these are birds that also build their nest on floating vegetation platforms and they'll actually cover their eggs with uh, additional nesting vegetation um, like, like this in the picture. Uh, when they have to leave the nest, they'll cover the eggs. And this not only helps protect the eggs from potential predators, um, it doesn't look like an obvious nest anymore, but it can actually help control the temperature of the eggs on really hot or cold days. Um, so that was, that was really a, a fun fact to learn about these birds. Um, they also eat a large amount of their own feathers, and because they eat a lot of things like crustaceans and aquatic insects like snails that have thick shells, um, it's really helpful to have these feathers in their gut because it helps prevent some of those hard, harmful prey parts from going into their intestines, and it helps them form pellets um, similar to owls that they'll then regurgitate. And the reason the pied-billed grebe um, is the comedian is because two of their calls here, to me, the o-whoop almost sounds like they're trying to make a joke. And then the hyena is a, just a long laugh. Um, that's what it sounds like to me. Um, so I, I find them to be very comical to hear in the field. Um, feel like they're just laughing at me most of the time. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll take a listen. Um, and then this is a great also image here for size. Um, so while these birds are also somewhat football shaped uh, like the common gallinule um, and American coot, they are much smaller in size, uh, much smaller than a mallard. And their main identifying feature is that stripe on the bill. Um, and their young are also very beautiful uh, with their 
they're very patterned faces here. Um, and they do stand out and they'll carry their young on their back oftentimes um, on the breeding season sites. So we'll listen to the O-whoop call and then the hyena. And then the hyena. <laughs> that faster laugh, <laughs> like a hyena laugh. And these birds, yeah, breed throughout throughout the state um, in some of these deeper water marshes or or areas adjacent to wetlands that are more open, um, like at St. Clair Flats or, or river mouths. Um, we also have a handful of secondary species that we keep an eye out for that were included in our spatial prioritization um, to help us identify priority areas for marsh birds. And those include marsh wrens, swamp sparrows, black crowned night herons, blue winged teal, and those coots, even though we included them in the, in the focal species, just because they can get confused with uh, common gallinule. Then we have a couple of less common secondary species like the black tern and yellow-headed blackbird uh, that we can see here in Michigan as well. And we'll, we'll skip some of the identifying features of these just for time. Um, so taking all of this information into account, the, the marsh bird population declines, um, as well as uh, the loss of wetlands that we've seen, um, Audubon created our vision plan to help restore uh, the the coastal wetlands that these birds need to thrive. Um, so the projects and programs highlighted in that vision plan um, are going to directly benefit these focal bird species and also help um, put the Great Lakes region on a path to long-term environmental health and resilience. So I'll share that plan uh, in, in the chat um, towards the end of the talk. I'll, I'll get that link in there for you. Um, so our coastal wetlands, I mentioned a lot of them have been lost. Um, we've lost over 50% of our coastal wetlands within the Great Lakes region. And in Grand, Grand, Grand Rapids alone, um, we've lost 73% of wetlands. And these wetlands provide critical resources, not just for these birds, but also for us. Um, and then our remaining wetlands across the Great Lakes and here in Michigan are battling ongoing degradation, uh, including things like urban uh, Oh my goodness, what am I thinking? Just urbanization, um, as well as urban runoff uh, is a real issue for our remaining wetlands. And then invasive species are also degrading habitats like Phragmites and frogbit. Um, and then our marsh bird population declines are really representative of the, the loss of our Great Lakes wetlands. Um, marsh birds are really great bioindicators. Um, so they're letting us know that something, something is wrong with our, our wetlands. We're also starting to see some population losses in some key waterfowl species as well, unfortunately. So that they're also letting us know that our wetlands could use a little more work. Um, so as far as what wetlands provide us and our communities, um, this is a, a great picture um, of an area where wetlands had existed around the edge of this small island, um, but as you can see, they are no longer there, um, that it was built upon uh, right to the edge, um, and there was no shoreline stabilization there. Um, wetlands can also help with erosion control. We've seen a lot of erosion uh, across Lake Michigan um, this past few, well, these past few years with those higher water levels. Um, storm surge buffering also to help with when instances occur like this where there are high winds or storms moving through an area. Uh, water uh, can also be stored in wetlands, uh, so that kind of flood conveyance factor. Um, wet wetlands also store carbon and they can help us with our water quality, filtering our water, as well as help recharge our groundwater. Um, which I know is an issue that isn't necessarily facing Kent County, but is um, impacting nearby Ottawa County um, on the east side as well. So 
um, it could potentially impact other, other watersheds um, in similar ways where groundwater is not able to recharge um, and wetlands or restoring wetlands can help improve that. So again, marsh birds are really great indicator species, and this is because they're sensitive to pollution. Invasive species, again, using Phragmites as an example, if Phragmites moves into a wetland area, even the species that prefer tall, dense stands of cattail will leave that area because they just don't like Phragmites. Um, they're not adapted to it. Um, and you know, we're starting to see some birds maybe after years of not having other opportunities or other, other plants to uh, nest in, will start to nest in Phragmites, but with much less success. Um, they are also ideal indicators for coastal wetland health across the Great Lakes because that's primarily where they reside. So I'm, I keep mentioning the spatial prioritization and I wanted to kind of show you what that looked like. Um, we took wetland uh, marsh bird observation data, kind of accounted for human error, and then compared the presence and absence of marsh birds against some satellite imagery of habitat characteristics. And then we did it by species um, to see which habitat characteristics each species liked and where they were most abundant. Um, and then we combined them all to create this spatial prioritization map. And this shows us the top coastal wetlands across the Great Lakes for marsh birds um, for those focal species. Um, so the, the brighter the area is, the higher quality that wetland is, and the, the best bang for our buck as far as on the ground conservation and restoration. Those are areas that have the, are most likely to succeed as well when it comes to restoration and conservation. Um, so for Michigan, let's see, here we go. So that helped us outline what our priority regions were across the Great Lakes, but, but here in Michigan as well. So we have five out of the 12 priority regions in our state. Um, and where you all are is where the Eastern Lake Michigan um, priority area falls which also doubles as a global important bird area. So our vision plan kind of outlines the work we wanna do, where we wanna do it, and what we are hoping to do moving forward in Michigan, we've started in a few places, um, is to improve wetland health by managing for invasive species, uh, doing some native plantings, and cleaning vegetation and water level management. So um, this, this ends up being a lot of different things. Sometimes we cut back uh, invasive species or create openings in native cattail, which can also form a big monoculture in an area. Um, sometimes it means we're installing water control structures at wetlands that are impounded. Um, so managers have more control over water levels. Um, and we also try to engage the communities in our work when we're doing this on the ground work. So we involve community scientists into our monitoring efforts, pre and post restoration. Um, so our priority projects, I just wanted to highlight the regions. We have the St. Mary's Mackinac Straits area, um, Saginaw Bay, where Wigwam Bay State Wildlife Area is. Uh, St. Clair Flats uh, State Wildlife Area, the St. Clair and Detroit River Systems, and then the Eastern Lake Michigan. And this highlights more so the mouth of the river, but I know farther, if we go farther down the river in the watershed, we'll, we'll find you all out in Grand Rapids. We've been working with Ottawa County Parks and Recreation since 2018 to collect baseline marsh bird uh, data. And we wanted to help them assess the restoration potential of Ottawa Sands County Park and the Sag Bay, which is just adjacent to the park. Um, we've helped uh, remove invasive species from Stearns Bayou. And we wanted also to drum up some excitement and foster stewards and advocates for their regional planning efforts. So we've had about a dozen or so marsh bird volunteers collecting marsh bird data. Uh, since 2019, they went back out in 2021 
Um, they were unable to complete a season in 2020 due to COVID. So we're, we're looking forward to updating our data summaries and sharing those with you um, likely next year. Um, this last year, we worked again with uh, Ottawa County Parks and Recreation on a Grand River Coastal Corridor report. Um, so this was an ecological assessment uh, that aimed to develop uh, some conservation recommendations for this corridor. So again, it's focused on the river mouth and along the, the Lake Michigan shoreline, um, but we wanted to, yeah, try to do some conservation planning um, in this globally important bird area. So the ecological threats that were determined, we interviewed over 20 stakeholders as part of this report align with what we would kind of expect based on what we know about the other ecological threats to the rest of the Great Lakes region. Habitat loss and degradation, invasive species are an issue. Uh, climate change is a big issue facing this particular region of the Grand River Coastal Corridor. Uh, hazardous materials and pollutants, there are certain industrial areas that are contributing to air and water pollution. Um, and then a lack of diverse community engagement was something that several stakeholders mentioned as well. And the ecological significance of the area, I thought you would all find this interesting. Um, this is data from Weather Radar um, that Michigan Natural Features Inventory put together um, that we got access to and we helped, we created these maps. Um, but it shows the spring peak bird migration uh, along the Grand River Coastal Corridor. And this is um, from April 20th to May 31st, between 2003 and 2008. And it shows you the number of years this area has been a hot spot for bird migration. So they're able to detect bird migration using that radar um, or yeah, NEXRAD data. Um, so we can see that a lot of this area in this coastal um, east, east Lake Michigan um, shoreline is incredibly important for migratory birds. Um, this area as well uh, falls along an ecotone or transition zone, which supports dozens of ecosystems and great levels of biodiversity. Uh, this area is also home to some of the highest quality natural communities in the state, also according to another Michigan Natural Features Inventory report. It also supports dozens of species of conservation concern and is a globally recognized Audubon important bird area for the number of waterfowl and water birds that use this, this coastal zone. Um, and then this is the map that shows it just updated slightly the uh, spring peak bird migration during sunrise. So this is as some birds are taking off to migrate during the day while others are settling in um, to rest during the day before migrating again at night. Uh, this area is also extremely climate resilient. If you haven't explored it, the Nature Conservancy has a resilient land mapping tool. It's really neat. You can see they have a bunch of different maps that show biodiversity levels of this area. You can look at the whole watershed. Um, and this area is extremely climate resilient along the coast. And these gray areas are developed areas. So these are areas that are less, less likely to be resilient um, so there's kind of a gap here uh, in resiliency. So trying to restore wetlands in this area in particular would be beneficial to the local communities, um, but also to the marsh birds. The river here is also state recognized um, for lake sturgeon and the Lake Michigan Committee also found this area to be extremely important for in-stream conservation and restoration for other fisheries. Uh, there's cultural value as well for the Gun Lake Tribe for wild rice and Lake Sturgeon within the Grand River. And it is also home to some of the top 20% uh, of wetlands for secretive marsh birds based on that spatial prioritization map I showed you. So this is a close up of the, the, the pretty one we put in our report. And then this is what we looked at more closely. Um, and it shows all of these are the top 20% of wetlands for marsh birds and they have different levels of protection. So we know the blue ones are protected. This is part of a of Grand Haven State Game Area. And then all of these islands are primarily privately owned and are not protected, um, but are also home to top 20% of our wetlands for marsh birds. 
Um, and then this area is a gap in another sense and that these wetlands are below um, or are not as, as high quality as these other ones. Um, but connecting these high quality wetlands to the coastline is extremely important just for habitat connectivity. Um, and this is also that area where wetlands could benefit climate resiliency. So taking all this data together, we were trying to figure out what those priority areas are. Um, and this is another area up in the northern end of the, the corridor boundary um, at Muskegon Lake and Muskegon River. And this, the bulk of these top 20% wetlands are within Muskegon State Game Area. So we outlined um, some priority areas for wetlands conservation based on the, the gaps I was just showing you on that map. Um, and trying to work with Ottawa County Parks to do some restoration at Ottawa Sands as well as the SAG. Um, and then Harbor Island is also a, a really important area for marsh birds um, as well as remediation and restoration with that full power plant closing. Um, and Dornbos Island is nearby as well, which is unprotected. And then these are the larger conservation recommendations that came out of that report. And we are continuing to work with stakeholders to move that work forward. Um, we're uh, hoping to get additional funding to help support that effort um, to keep the facilitation of those stakeholders moving forward, as well as diversify those stakeholders at a few more community groups and more folks from Muskegon County um, and Kent County into that effort. And so hopefully we'll we'll get that funding and we'll we'll keep you all posted on the progress. Uh, those are some of the collaborators on the report. Lots of names there <laughs> um, to thank. And I just wanted to to share now some calls to action. You know, what can we do as Audubon members? Um, what can we do as bird watchers? Um, so it's really up to us to care for these natural areas. And so far, uh, especially here in Michigan, hunters have really supported our state lands conservation, especially with those state game and state wildlife areas that were the, the ones that were so lit up on that wetlands map. Um, but the consistent national trend is that hunting is on the decline. And that means there are fewer resources for the restoration and maintenance of all those important wetlands. Also, majority of our 103 important bird areas here in Michigan are owned and managed by Michigan DNR as well. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can get involved and, and be better stewards for these areas. So we're doing that with community science and stewardship, um, but we also have some other recommendations. Whoops. Um, so you can support your local conservation organizations. Uh, you can support your public lands. There aren't a lot of ways we can financially support our public lands here in Michigan as bird watchers, unfortunately. Um, you know, you get your park passes, um, but it's it's very different as far as hunter monies go. Um, they have Pittman Robertson Act funds, um, so all the excise taxes on their equipment go towards our state game and wildlife areas. Um, all of their hunting license fees go towards the management and protection of those areas as well. Um, but we can purchase duck stamps, which can help go towards purchasing uh, wetlands uh, for the wildlife refuge system. You can also make a donation directly to the Adopt a Game Area program. Uh, several of those game areas on that list are important bird areas. And you can actually select which game area you want your funds to go towards. Um, so that's kind of a nice option as well. It's not uh, all exhaustive though, that list is short. It doesn't include all of our game and wildlife areas. Um, I also encourage you to use eBird when you're birding, especially if you visit an important bird area or if you encounter one of those focal species that we learned about tonight. Um, those are really important and we definitely utilize that eBird data. Um, we also encourage you to talk to your legislators about local conservation issues or sources of, of conservation funding. Um, like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And then also encourage you to participate in public input sessions. Um, there is a, a, an input opportunity for the Grand River uh, watershed, larger Grand River watershed. So I'll share that with you in the chat as well. Um, and that's through the Lower Grand River 
um, organizations of watersheds, the ELGRO. Um, so if you are not familiar with them, um, I will share that link with you all. Whoops. Um, and hopefully you can explore their website and learn more about the watershed plan that they've drawn up um, for the, the greater Grand River watershed. I also wanted to share with you that volunteers for March Bird Surveys are going to be needed again in 2022. Uh, we will be expanding routes at Ottawa Sands County Park because we got some sustaining our Great Lakes funding, yay, <laughs> um, to do some wetlands restoration there. Uh, over the next two years. And then we are working with our stakeholders again, um, not only to move forward on our conservation recommendations from that report, but to expand marsh bird monitoring into Muskegon and Kent counties over the next couple of years. Um, so there will hopefully be areas closer to home for you in Grand Rapids um, in the next year or two that you can go out and survey um, if you're interested. And with that, I thank you all very much for being patient. I know it was a little longer than usual, um, but if you wanna keep in touch, these are great ways to contact me directly or to follow the MI Birds program. Thank you, Erin, appreciate your time tonight. Um, yeah, no problem. We will